morning, everybody. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast. We're glad to have you with us today. So I got a couple of exciting things to talk about. Three exciting things to talk about. So first of all, we'll start with our weekly contest. Our episodes are sponsored by Pandasaurus at Board Game Breakfast, and we are talking about Umber Via, which we played last week. And I will be reviewing, I think it's this week, actually. It's this week or next week. I'll be reviewing the game, talking about it. But in... I don't know how to explain it, folks. You have to go watch it. It's area control, but bidding, it kind of mixed together in a very clever way. And the reason I mentioned clever is because clever is the key word to enter the contest. We're giving away three copies of it. This is a different contest than the past ones we've run. To folks in the USA, Canada, Australia, email us at contest at dicetower.com. In the subject line, put the word clever, clever girl. Uh, just clever. Um, and in the subject, put your address and answer this question. What does Umbra, U-M-B-R-A, mean in Latin? So, there you go. So that's exciting thing number one. You can enter the contest, three copies. We'll let you know if you win. Of course, you can check out all our winners at Dicetower.com slash contests. Okay, so second thing. We have a birthday that we are celebrating. Adam Bannock, congratulations. He's one of our uh, listeners. He's turned 50 today. Turned 50 today? Although you'll, you'll meet some pedantic people who say you don't turn that age until the minute you were born. No one goes to those people's parties. All right. So Adam is a middle school teacher, which we all know right now. Not only is that one of the toughest jobs in the world pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, can you imagine trying to do that? Adam, fantastic. He says his dream job would be to work for Dice Tower. But <laughs> uh, anyway, hopefully we'll meet you, Adam, at a future convention. And we just wanted to give a big shout out. Happy birthday to you. What's the third exciting thing is that we are only two weeks away from the Spring Spectacular. I'm excited about the Spring Spectacular, folks. During the Spring Spectacular this year, we're gonna be talking about some games. One that's really cool, I can't even tell you about. Other ones, we'll be playing some of the hot games we've been talking about. Stardew Valley, for example, will be played during our Spring Spectacular. Also, Mike Delisio will be doing his top 50 solo games of all time, and other various sundry things with contests, live top 10, and more come back and that's two weeks from today it will start it'll be for four days our spring spectacular Alrighty. well with all that going let's start board game breakfast here we go hi i'm ambi and recently i've been talking about free print and play games but i'm going to take a little break from that and this week i'm going to talk about baby games back when i first started segments on board game breakfast i was talking about games that i could play with my babies or trying to play a game with my nine month old babies at the time. But now my babies are 17 months old, so I've actually been playing some board games with them with modified rules. I couldn't find any games for children under two years, but Haba actually has a line of games for children two plus years called My Very First Games, and those have been really good for playing with my kids. The games have nice chunky wooden components and then some cardboard pieces that are also pretty thick. So when my kids put them in their mouth, they are pretty durable and stay in good condition. One of my kids has had a lot of fun playing Teddy's Colors and Shapes, which is a game with a lot of different wooden colored shapes that you put into holes in these cardboard boards. In the actual game, you're supposed to roll a die and then take that color or shape on your turn, but I just let my kids try to put any shape into the holes, and one of them is actually quite good at getting the shapes matched well like, it, like it's a puzzle. My other kid really likes the game First Orchard, which has a bunch of chunky wooden fruit pieces that you're supposed to put into a basket, but he really likes putting them in his mouth and chewing on them, but sometimes he does like putting them in the basket, which is also fun. The actual game is a lot more complicated. Again, you're rolling a die and trying to pick the colored pieces to put into the basket before the crow goes all the way to the edge, but we just play with the pieces and the basket, and they have a lot of fun. So far, I've played five different games with my kids with these house rules. First Orchard, here Fishy Fishy, Teddy's Colors and Shapes, Go Away Monster, and Tidy Up, and they've loved all of them. If you want to read more about how we've been playing each specific game and how they like them, then you can check out my written reviews on BoardGameBlitz.com. Bye! Thirty years ago, today we're talking about a game that is not that exciting. <laughs> All right, so that is, um, all right, Mind Trap. 
the name eluded me. So actually there's Mind Trap came out 30 years ago, then in 1997 was Mind Trap 2. And if you go look at my rating, I gave the first one a 5 and the second one a 4.5. I don't even know what a 4.5 means actually. But I still have one of these games at my house. Now why would I keep a game that I don't like? Because Mind Trap is essentially just a pile of puzzles. Like John and Susan are lying on the floor dead. There is water and glass around them. What happened? And you're like, well, Alvin killed them because Alvin's a cat and they're both goldfish that were in a bowl that was knocked over. I spoiled a puzzle from one of these two games. I don't remember which one it's in. But that's what it's like. That's interesting. I love that stuff. Not in a game. There's nothing more exciting than watching people sit there and try to figure out a puzzle quietly. And so these are worth getting to have a bunch of these puzzles. And there's some things in them. And Mind Clash... Uh, Mind Trap 2 actually had those, um, I don't remember which one, had, honestly I don't remember which one had which stuff. They have all the different puzzles. And again, they're fun puzzles to do in person. Like, oh, I'll pull this out and mess with it. But as a game, it's pretty terrible. Um, I like the concept of these a lot more um, than the actual game itself. And I might pull one out and say, hey kids, try to solve these puzzles, do this, you know, etc. But I wouldn't do it where we roll around the board and do that sort of thing. But there you go. So 30 years ago, Mind Trap, ah, just buy a book of these puzzles, honestly. You're better off for doing that. But if you find it at a thrift shop and you want to give yourself some mind teasers and or someone else, just don't play the actual game inside. Hey everybody. Hello, we are Ryan and Bethany. From Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. Today we're talking about Kingswood. This is kind of a worker placement game in a way. You've got six different spots around the board and one of them is kind of like a wild spot that changes each time you play. But wherever you start from, you take that action and wherever you end from, you get that action as well, which I thought that was kind of a neat me mechanism. Uh, what you're trying to do is you are trying to collect all these different resources and then you can exhaust them in order to defeat monsters. And then you can go on the board and you can kind of refresh those, those resources, get them back so that you can go on and defeat bigger and badder monsters later on in the game. Uh, it's, it's like a really clever, simple game uh, and lots of ways to get points from those monsters. So sometimes I like super crunchy games, right? Like we all do occasionally. And then sometimes we get these really fun light games that to me are just so enjoyable and I really like playing them and Kingswood is definitely one of them. It was just super simple and light and straightforward and I just had a blast playing this one. Yeah, I liked it too. I thought it was, was simple and it was a fun filler game. I, I did feel like the decisions in this game left me a little bit wanting. This isn't a filler game. I felt like it was a filler game to me. It filled my whole, my heart with sadness. <laughs> <laughs> I just felt like the decisions that you made were between I had one bad option and one like okay option. All my options were good. I never felt like I was in a situation where I was like choosing between two really cool things. At least that's how I felt. Yeah. Well, we I also didn't win ever out of any of the times we've ever played this game. Super light, man. It's my jam. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, guys, thank you so much for watching. You can find us on YouTube or Facebook. We are Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. Well, until then, this is Ryan. I'm Bethany. Hoping you have a healthy, happy breakfast. Bye, Bye everybody. Guys. Hey there everyone, it's Jen, the board game librarian, flipping some pages and pushing some cues with my segment from the page to the table. As always, I'm going to pair a book and a board game together that share a common theme. Uh, this week I'm going to do my favorite in the series and that is Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire by J.K. Rowling. I loved the competition part. I loved the different schools from all across the world coming together and competing for this um, for the tournament cup. Uh, I think we got a lot of really great characters, some maturity going on. So and I gave away a little hint there if you were listening closely in terms of what my pairing would be this week. And that is Harry Potter House Cup Competition by the OP. Two to four players, ages 11 up and 75 minutes. Um, I was sent this by the OP and it's a very much an introductory worker placement game. This is one that's going to be perfect to go into my library's circulating board game collection because Harry Potter games are wickedly popular and games that are very introductory in nature and family friendly are a smash hit. 
In this game, you are the different schools um, and the different houses um, competing to get the most points. You're looking to cast a bunch of spells. You're looking to um, recruit allies and get a whole bunch of different things. Um, you go to various places on the board and to different professors' offices to gain the supplies and resources that you need. That's all for this week. I'll remind you again, a brand new YouTube channel with my husband and I called The Literary Gamers. A mild-mannered librarian by day and her mild-mannered writer husband by night. I'm pairing together to talk about books, board games, and everything else under the sun. I um, hope to see you on that new YouTube channel. Happy breakfast! I have not heard of these Harry Potter books. I should probably get around. No, I've read them. I'm currently reading a new series of books, but I'm, I don't, I may not make it past a couple more chapters. It's so close. Anyhow, um, all right, so what's coming this week? Well, Tomorrow, I'm taking a look at eight negative reviews of small games. Uh, the big reviews of this week will be me and my kids will be taking a look at Stardew Value, Va Valley, not Stardew Values, that's a different game. And also, we're getting a Four Squares review of it from Z, Mike, Chris, and Roy. So everyone at the Dice Tower is taking a look at Stardew Value, Valley. Uh, I'll also be taking a look at Fiam, Haunted Mansion, Sumatra, Genotype, Unforgiven, Fantasy Realms with the Expansion, Mystic Monkeys, we got a werewolf game going up this week, I'm doing my top 10 action point games. Tomorrow, we're posting Dice Tower episode 700, in which we listen to a lot of the viewers, or not viewers, listeners, uh, fans jump on board. So hopefully you take a listen to that, if you never listened to that, check it out. Also this week, and I'm very excited about this, we have... Um, Tim Chuan is joining our channel to be doing over uh, how to play videos. That's something we really haven't had on our channel as a how to play games and he'll be showing you how to play smartphone. And so he'll be coming in every other week or so with these videos. They're fantastic. He's one of the best I've ever seen doing this and so I'm really excited about that. Um, also Chris and Wendy are reviewing games now if you've missed that where they are taking a look at um, the heavy Euro games that we don't take a look at. So all that stuff and more is coming from the Dice Tower this week. Let's keep going. What is up? My name is Melissa McCack and this is my brother, Justin Maycack. Hey, hey, everybody. This is Smashing Buttons and Slamming Cards. This is a segment where I talk about a video game I love and I connect it to a board game I love. And sometimes I have Justin talk about video games, so let's do it up. Yeah, so today I'm going to talk about RimWorld, which is a cool, I believe it's only on PC game, where essentially this ship crash landed onto a planet and you're managing the people that crash landed there to kind of help them survive, right? So they gotta start figuring out farming and shelter and all those things. And you're essentially changing this planet up wherever you landed to make it livable for this now brand new colony that just uh, crash landed onto it. So I wanna connect that to terraforming Mars, because pretty much in RimWorld, you're terraforming this planet to live on. And that's what you're doing in terraforming Mars. You're all sort of collectively trying to add to the like oxygen levels and the temperature and everything to make it livable on Mars. Except you are not cooperating yeah. actually, you're different companies and you're trying to vie for victory and there's like awards to be had and uh, the cards, I love the cards in this game because they have different symbols and everything but the card tells you exactly what it does anyway. Right. So when you get real familiar with the game you could just look at the symbols like, oh okay it does that. But while you're learning, it's like, oh, okay, it does that. You know, so it's pretty easy, I find, uh, for the depth that comes in this game. Anyway, that is it for this week. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like, you can check out our channel called Room 51. We'll catch you next time. This is a segment where we take a look at a board game based on an IP. I tell you if the IP and the mechanisms match together and whether it's a game you should check out or not. Today, we're going to look at Monster Crunch. We'll take a look at it. I'll come back and tell you what we think. So the game very easy setup. You take your cereal bowl, you take your two powers that you have. Each character is going to have two. Then you'll take your deck, you'll shuffle it up, you'll draw 12 cards into your hand, and you're ready to start playing. Then the next player has to play a card that's equal to it, which could be three, or something higher than it. In this case, he'll play an eight. 
<laughs> then if you played an eight, that means Count Chacula would have to play a card that's either equal to or higher. In this case, maybe he'll play the eight card. And that will continue on until somebody passes. In addition, you have these milk tokens. And the milk tokens will allow you to play multiple cards. If on your turn you're unable or unwilling to play a card, you'll just take these cards, putting them in your scoring pile, and then you'll take a milk token from the supply, and that will get you an extra milk token when you pass. Unless you're the last person to pass, in this case Frankenberry, then you would take your scoring cards, you would score those, but you do not get an extra milk token. At the end of the round, whatever cards you have left in your hands will continue to stay in your hand, and then you will draw up for the next round. At the end of the game, you count up the number of cards, not the values, the number of cards in your scoring pile. Whoever has the most cards is eating the most cereal, and they are the winner of the game. Monster Crunch tries really hard. It, it's based off a breakfast cereal, so what are you going to do here? And, and, and you're getting rid of the cereal, I guess, as you're playing the cards down. No, not really. The IP is kind of lost on me here, although it does have the nostalgia factor. If you remember eating this as a kid and for some reason the cereal meant a lot to you, you're going to like this uh, a lot more than than somebody who didn't, I suppose. The game is okay. It's, it's, a, it's a fairly decent game, probably a 6 on a BGG scale. I think the game is fun. I played it with kids. I can play this with nearly anyone. They kind of understand what's going on. But the IP and the mechanisms, no. You know, I didn't even get a box of Frankenberry or Booberry with this game. None of that was included. You can't eat your components. Kind of a bummer for me. But if you like the nostalgia, I think it's going to go up for everyone else. Eh, at best. I actually hate cereal, but I like that game. So, go figure. All right, so folks, we talked about last week uh, the anatomy of a board game review, and I talked a little bit about um, kind of how I pick the reviews that I do. Now I want to talk a little bit about um, the things that go into the thoughts of a review. And I'll start with, real quick, touching on how often I play a game, and my answer to that is enough. And you may argue with that, but anyone who always argues with, did I play a game enough, will never be satisfied with an answer to that anyway. Um, but it could be a play, half a play, very rare. But some bad games, don't, you're like, ah, this game's so terrible. Or multiple plays. I don't believe you need to play it with every player count and with every possible configuration. It's just not possible to do the number of reviews that we do and do that. And if you hold that against us, I completely understand. I don't think anyone should take a review as gospel anyway. But I do believe that informed opinions based on thousands and thousands of different games played will help. But if it makes you feel better, any game I don't like that you like, just assume I don't know how to play it. Because people tell me that all the time. Um, but as it is, so I put a lot of thought into the reviews. I really do. A good chunk of my week uh, spent with administration. But the rest of it is on, on reviews. And... When I review a game, I always read the rules before I do the review again. I'm a speed reader, so that helps too. But I read the rules again. I, the first thing I do before I review, the first thing every time, is the how to play part. It's actually my least favorite part of doing a review. I feel like I'm pretty good at summarizing a game fairly quickly, but I just don't like doing it because if you make any minor mistake, people then, that's why you didn't like the game or what have you, um, if you don't like a game. If you like a game, people are completely forgiving. You can do whatever you want. You can say the rule's completely wrong, but if you like the game, no one cares. Um, but So I, I go over that rules thing, but I think it's important. And the reason I do it is because I think, while it's not something everybody wants to see, it does help conceptualize it and it helps me. Because explaining the game another time then lets me jump into the why I liked it and don't like it. And as I go over it and explain the game, I remember those things. I also talk about components. And again, that's something not a lot of people think is important, but for me really is. Uh, so those are the two things I do. Uh, after that, though, um, when it comes time to do the review itself, now some people have very specific rubrics that they do. In fact, Z has this very cool target system that he talks about. I get that and I understand that. For me, I want it to be a little bit more stream of consciousness. I hope my stream of consciousness is somewhat useful and I have restarted them before because I say, oh, I should have talked about this, I didn't do that, or I just messed up here. 
But I sit there and think about it. If it's a bigger review, I'll even jot down points that I want to cover when I'm going over to review. But I want you to get how the game made me feel. Did I think it was super fun? Then I'll explain the reasons why it was fun. Dude, I think it was pretty terrible. I better tell you why I think it's terrible. But also, I want to point out the good things I liked about the game. And if I like a game and there's things I didn't like, I want to point them out also. I usually don't cover price in games, although it's occasionally mentioned if it's something I think major, like this is a really expensive game for how small the game feels, or it's a really good, huge game for how small the price, but I usually don't mention prices because price points are different for everybody. Different people are going to get different things from the prices of games. Um, I, I Component quality is a big deal, theme's a big deal. Um, how the game plays is a big deal, and I try to put all that into words. I didn't used to put numbers on my reviews. In fact, I still don't put a number on a review, although week in review, I put a number on them. But even those, I mean, I think they hold some water, and I give a seal of approval at the end if it's a seven or higher, but a seal of approval is a game that I think is good and worth recommending. And then an 8.5 is a seal of excellence. And it's funny because there's a lot of games that are eight, and I'm like, these games are fantastic, fun games. And people say, well, then why didn't it get excellence? Because I want that to be a step above. I want to give very few seals of excellence, like maybe 30 a year compared to the maybe 150 of, the ec of approvals or more of those. So I think about all this stuff. I record all that information, do all that, and then hand the review off to Roy, and then I'm done. You know, I might talk to Roy about some of the details that go into it, but all the rest of it is. Occasionally, I do a um, funny review, like the other week I did Groundhog Day, and that's a little bit different on how I set that sort of thing up, or a review where I'm going to trash a game we might do somewhat differently. But for the most part, I treat all my reviews the same. I review my reviews that go up in a week. I usually review them in the order I post them, not always, and sometimes I'll take one of the bigger reviews and save it to last because more thought needs to go into that one. And there have been times where I've scheduled a review, went over it and said, you know what, I need more time with this game and then pushed that review back a week. Which is why sometimes you don't see the bigger reviews farther down. The four corner reviews that we do with multiple viewpoints, I would like to do more of those and in fact we are doing more of those than we used to. Uh, just the fact that not everyone here can always play the same games. Um, and so we don't always all get together. And the fact that we're not all playing the same games lets us cover more games and get more viewpoints. It's just sometimes the game is big enough that we feel like it warrants that or we just all want to talk about the game for some reason or other. So um, let's see here. I think that's pretty much all I had. Um, someone said Tom Vassell reviews are gospel truth. That I don't think. I mean, I'll stand by my opinion and for fun, I'll argue to death over it, right? But I don't care that strongly. I always find it odd when people almost like ashamedly say, I like this game that you said was bad. Fantastic. I like, I hate it. This game you said is good. Don't mind. There's so many games out there and I've yet to meet a human being on earth that doesn't like at least one of the same games as me. Um, I guess there's, there must be someone out there who, who's the direct opposite of me, but they are in a... Um, one of those, uh, what's the fantasy flight game where every deck is different? Uh, oh. <laughs> Keyforge. Keyforge. They're my, uh, they're my Keyforge deck somewhere across the globe. Um, but anyway, uh, the number ratings, someone says, you know, what's the difference between numbers? I can talk about that before. I know the difference between my numbers. Because a 7.5 is better than a 7. And an 8 is better than a 7.5. And when you play 7,000 games, you want to differentiate them a little more. But that's just me. I, would, I like a 20-point scale. I feel Actually, it's more like a 15-point scale because once you go below 5, what does the points matter anymore? But anyhow, now I'm rambling. Bad stream of consciousness. Let's keep moving. Hey, hey folks, Anthony here once again going through a bunch of old Favorite Game Friday picks for my Board Game Breakfast segment here. We're going to pick up where we left off, which is a game that I am thankful for. I'm very thankful that escape room games became a thing. I used to work in an escape room, so it's very cool to see the evolution of those games come to life. Next is a game that is hard to learn, Robinson Crusoe. Quite the steep learning curve there, but still enjoy it. Uh, next, best game in a small box. How can you go wrong with Flux? You okay, buddy? Next, game to give as a gift. 
Uh, I think Just One is a great game to give people as a gift. Very easy to learn, easy to teach. We're going to go with favorite game to play with family, Silver and Gold. I had the most success with teaching to my family, so I'm going to go with that. Uh, next, we've got a must own. I think everybody should own Dixit. Uh, it's just such a an accessible game and easy to get to the table and, and easy for mostly every age to play. Next, we've got a game from 2017, Queen Domino, my favorite from that year. Most anticipated. Now, again, this category was posed way back when, uh, so it's different now. But for me, currently, most anticipated game that's coming out. I'm going to go with expansions here. I love Draftosaurus. There's two expansions coming out, so I'm really looking forward to those. Next, we've got a game that you want to get back to the table. It's Back to the Future, Hi. Back in Time. Been too long since I played that one. And we move on to favorite game app. I think the Pandemic app is fabulous. Let's you play as any character. Well, not any character, but most of the characters. And you can play by yourself and control all four of them, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Next, favorite campaign yeah. game. I have to go with Dungeons & Dragons because it's kind of the only one that I've played. And after that, we have favorite game for Date Night. Any co-op game. I'm going to go with uh, Flashpoint Fire Rescue because that's a fun one to play. And finally on this page, we've got favorite big box. I don't have any of those super big box games. I don't have Gloomhaven or Kingdom Death Monster or anything the big box. So the biggest box I think I own in my collection is either Summon Wars or Isle of Cats. And that's it for today. Oh, well, our time's up. Say bye-bye. WandaVision. I've waited till it was over to talk about it, so I would like to talk about it. I'm not going to do any major spoilers, but there's the possibility of minor spoilers, so skip ahead a couple minutes if you don't want to hear minor spoilers. But um, this is a self-contained TV show, which essentially was a five to six hour movie, really, uh, that is about Wanda, the Scarlet Witch, and Vision. And if you I mean, I'm sorry, at this point, if you haven't watched Endgame, I don't know what to tell you. But Vision died in Endgame, so yet he's here. So WandaVision, without spoiling it, starts out by showing Wanda and Vision in a 1950s TV show. And in episode two, they're in a 1960s TV show, which to my kids, they couldn't tell the difference. In fact, I didn't realize that until halfway through. I was like, oh. And then in the third episode, third, third episode they're in a 1970s TV show, and then I can't tell you anymore after that. But... Why are they in this TV show? Well, the show takes its time telling you to the point where my kids at first were kind of like, why are we watching this dumb sitcom and why is everybody laughing and why is everyone acting like morons? Um, but I liked it. I liked the nostalgia. My wife really likes old sitcoms, so she really liked it. In fact, I think she liked this more than she liked some of the Marvel movies. I thought it was good because I love the concept. They did something I've never seen a TV show do before. They, ex they explored grief and depression in an interesting way and they also shows, showed some flash bang wallop zoom special effects and everything else and that was pretty cool you know there was some pretty cool action sequences there's call outs and things that other stuff in the marvel universe and in fact i think you could enjoy this never having watched anything else but it would really help you to have seen at least avengers uh, Age of Ultron and Avengers Infinity War slash Avengers Endgame because I really think you would miss out on a lot if you didn't see those. I really think you need to watch at least Avengers Ultron because the, the stuff in this series is a direct result to that. They did a couple things in this series that made me just almost fall out of my chair and surprise, which I won't spoil. I thought the ending was really good. A couple teasers as to future stuff. This show is leading into the Doctor Strange movie that's coming out. Either end of this year or next year. I'm not sure when it's coming out. But I'm excited about that. I'm excited to see how this goes in. This is a very different show. Like, I'm really pumped. In a couple weeks, they're doing the Winter Soldier and the, Fal the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And I'm really pumped about that because that looks like an entertaining bash em up Marvel show, you know, and I'm excited about that. And I was not as excited about WandaVision, but I have to tell you, I really like it. Uh, when, if, if I'm putting it as its own movie, it's solidly as good as, if not better, than many of the Marvel Cinematic uh, Universe things. Uh, I, I, uh, you know, the, the end of it was really, I thought the, the finale and the ending was really good. 
You know, some people, the second last episode is possibly one of the best episodes of Marvel Cinematic stuff ever. It really does a good job at um, exploring things on a personal level. I, I don't want to say much more about than that. Anyway, I was very entertained by this. I would like to go back someday and watch it all in a row, although that's really a long period of time, although I know someone who just did that. Um, <laughs> uh, so that's interesting. I like it a lot. The Marvel Cinematic Universe has like five, six different things coming out this year. I'm super excited about all of them. I'm glad they're back with a bang. I like seeing this new phase, introducing new characters. They introduced um, at least one new character in this one, brought back a couple minor characters from previous movies and things. But the one new character they introduced, I thought was a very solid new character. And we'll see more of her in the future too. I believe that she's in an upcoming movie also. Um, bad guy was a little... Generic, one of the bad guys. One of the bad guys is amazing, okay? And has the best theme song in history. But the other bad guy was, I thought, a little over the top, bad the generic. That, that would be my one negative thing. I was like, come on, are you kidding me? And my other negative thing, and you won't understand this unless you've seen the show, is something I thought was amazing and fantastic was opening the door to a humongous thing, turned out to be a red herring of sorts. And while I get it and it makes sense in the wider thing, I was hoping for something else, which did not happen. But there you go. That's my trying not to spoil it. I would give it a 9 out of 10. Fantastic show, WandaVision. Hey, I'm Grant with Grant's Game Rex. Today, I want to recommend a really underrated deck building game, Battle for Greyport. One of my favorite games of all time is the Red Dragon Inn. I made a video for it several months ago. But the reason I like this game is because of the theme. In it, you are a band of adventurers after the adventure is over, celebrating and getting drunk in a pub, last one to pass out wins. Battle for Greyport is the prequel to this game. Where Red Dragon Inn is the getting drunk after the adventure, Battle for Greyport is the actual adventure. You get to see all your favorite characters before they were drunks. Yeah, in Red Dragon Inn, you're like, ah, oh, Gurky is a drunk idiot who keeps stealing all my gold. And in Battle for Greyport, you're like, oh, Gurky's a contributing member of society. Battle for Greyport is a cooperative game. Each player will start with their own hand of cards that is fairly weak. Each player will also have a number of hit points and monsters in front of them they need to defeat. There are also monsters in front of locations. We need to defeat these monsters to save locations, and throughout the game, you will be able to upgrade your hand with better heroes and items. Battle for Greyport comes with seven different scenarios ranging from easy to very difficult. So if you want it to be a drinking game like Red Dragon Inn, just play an easy scenario. You can get drunk along the way. Then play a hard scenario and you'll be like, I gotta stop drinking. All right, everybody. So that is the end of another board game breakfast. Don't forget our contest at the beginning. Go back and jump into that. We got more live stuff coming and just half an hour. Z is going to be playing Seven Wonders live on What's Happening. And then at noon, I'll be back with a Q&A. And then tomorrow we got uh, Shoots of Marbles, folks. Shoots of Marbles. It's your last chance or your second last chance to see the old track because the new track is almost in the mail coming its way towards us. Excited about that. Anyway. Good things all around, folks. Uh, I guess I should give a quick update on the search for a new studio. Okay, that was my update for the search for a new studio. So uh, hopefully I'll have better news for you. But when we do get a new studio and we do start moving in, we're going to just video the entire process of it, folks, so you can see us and how that works and everything. So hopefully hopefully that will be interesting. I want to start that series. Um, we said we do behind the scenes. We didn't realize this would be the behind the scenes thing we were doing. But uh, just keep us in mind as we look for a place um, and scrounge together the money and the time to get moving here. But that's that's, that's an issue for, well, now, but uh, we'll talk about it later. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs>
<laughs> I was waiting for someone else to say something, but I'm by myself. I'm a little out of it, folks, this weekend. I've been doing math and paperwork all weekend. Until next time, I'm Tom Bassett. You've been watching Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production.